Thanks, Fiona. Well, I'm here, I'm here today. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, this is my husband, Phil, who I say really saves my, saved my life because one of the first things that he told me when I, when I had a big tumour in my left breast was uh, don't be rushed into anything. And I think that is, if you take anything at home from this today from us, is, is take your time, okay? Because if, you, if you've been diagnosed with cancer, um, you're in shock and a lot of the things that um, conventional treatment get you to do very fast need a lot of thought and um, and I think that was probably the best thing that Phil ever said to me. Now um, I'll probably, you were going to do the intro weren't you? So I'll pass you over. <laughs> Go on. All right, thanks. Um, is it too loud for you? Is, is that better? Oh it's all right, she's always too loud, don't worry about it. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to sort of like talk a little bit about the um, breast screening program um, and also the dangers that are involved with it, but also give you an idea about all the methods that you can use. And yeah, we're going to talk mainly about thermography as other methods because that's what we do. Um, but in the film, we do talk about other breast screening um, procedures. So why we made the film? Because when we looked at mammography, we found it to be very, very limited. And it's limited by a lot of different things. One of the, one of the things it's limited by is age. The promise of mammography was to detect the condition early and to save lives. Well, if anybody thinks that waiting until you're 50 years old is early detection, that's a little bit mad from, from the way that we see it. And also, it's limited by breast density. So if your breasts are dense, then a mammogram is going to do very, very little for you. And in, in, in the States at the moment, there are a number of states that have um, laws for breast density. It's actually called Are You Dense, which is, I thought was, was quite good. Um, so we'll talk a little bit in detail. How we're going to do this is we're, I'm going to pass you back to Rosa in a minute, and she will build up the story for you of why we got to do this film and why we thought sharing all of the information uh, in the film was important. And later on, we're going to show you a clip of the film. And I think some of the things in the film will surprise you, and I think some of them may shock you. Um, because I think the last thing I'm going to say before I hand you back to Rosa is that the only thing that we could say that was certain about mammography was that it increases every woman's risk of getting breast cancer. And you'll see what we, what we mean later on. So I'm going to... Well, our, our journey started in 2006. Um, I had been aware of uh, a large tumour in my left breast. Sorry, is it too much feed? Too loud? Okay, all right. Is that better? Tell me, is that a good level? Can you hear at the back? Yeah? No, can't hear in the back. All right, okay. Okay, okay, I'll uh, try and project my voice a bit anyway. Um, yeah, in 2006, um, I, well, I'd known I had this tumour for about a year, but, uh, but I chose to ignore it for quite a while. Um, and that's a different story. I haven't got time for that today. But anyway, um, I told my Phil, Phil that I'd found this tumor. And um, initially, because he's a homeopath, he, we gave ourselves some time to think about things. Now, um, it was quite a large tumor. So 
uh, the thought of actually going down the normal medical uh, procedure, which is go to your doctor and be referred to a breast clinic, uh, and then have a, a mammogram biopsy, um, scared me to death. Because I thought, there's no way I'm going to stick my left breast in one of those machines and have it squashed with the size of the tumour. And the way that I looked at it as well, I thought, well, um, a mammogram is going to show me a tumour, but it's not really going to show me much else if it's active or, or what's happening there. So I decided not to go for a mammogram initially because of that reason. Um, I think it's really weird that us women do this. Has anybody had a mammogram here? Yeah. Did any, anybody find it painful? Yeah. Yeah, we all do, don't we? Just bear with me. It's a bit like this, isn't it? <laughs> um, and I don't think men would do it, do you? No? I don't think men would do it. Us women would like men to do it, <laughs> yeah? But I'm sure there's not many, many men that would uh, have their private parts squashed between in this panini, panini uh, shaped device. Yeah, but it's, yeah, <laughs> it's all right for us women. Now, I don't know, I don't know whether you know, um, there is an awful lot of uh, compression used on a woman's breast when they have a, have a mammogram. And um, anybody, uh, any ideas? Shall I give you a bit of a clue? It's, it's approximately, so scientists say, about 300 newtons. Does that help anybody? Okay, this might. Oh, sorry, <laughs> wrong picture. <laughs> that was a man having his uh, bits chopped off, like women have their breasts. I forgot to do that, but in the uh, so sorry, women have their breasts cut off, their things taken out as soon as their body starts speaking to them. This is what this is all about. And this, I was meant to pass it back over to Phil. Men wouldn't do it, would they? They wouldn't have their private bits cut off the way that women do straight away. Sorry, that was part of it. Sorry. Now, the weight. That's about right? It's frightening, isn't it, when you think about that? And the way that Phil explained this to me was that if you've got a tumour there and it takes about 20 pounds of weight to actually disturb it, mind you, my sister's a doctor and she actually says when she was trained as a doctor, what actually happens is they're told when they, they touch a woman's breast, especially if there's a tumor there, that they do it very lightly because even examining it can actually push cancer cells out and spread it around your body. And there they are like slamming your breast between two plates, you know? So I didn't want that. I didn't want that at all. And of course, I was under a lot of pressure because my, my two, two of my members of my family are, are medical doctors. So they wanted me to go and get the tumour removed and, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so I decided at that point I wasn't going to do that. Um, in the meantime, while I was uh, contemplating death, uh, my husband was doing lots of research. Yeah? Do you wanna, shall I pass it over to you for a bit? I honestly didn't know she was going to show them, honestly, especially the one with the fellow with his bits uh, <laughs> cut off. Because, uh, you know, it, it, it is true. I mean, if you can imagine being a fellow and somebody saying to you, right, I want to put them in there, and then we're going to squeeze them as hard as they can, and we might want to cut them off just in case. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to get many fellas sort of turning around to do that. But, right, when, when Rosa was contemplating death, I was sort of contemplating how do I prevent that event? You know, um, what what are we going to do? And I knew that... Rosa didn't necessarily want to go down the orthodox way, so it meant that we had to do a little bit of research in looking at other methods, because right now, at that, uh, or right then at that time, we had no clue of the status of Rosa's breast lump. And so we first, uh, we, we, we needed to find out what was happening, but it was the method that we used, and we, the mammography was out of the question, not just because of compression, but because of other um, the other dangers. So 
we started to research, and it was actually a friend of ours under the homeopathy who said, have you, have, you, have you had a look at thermography? And I knew what thermography was, but I thought it was just if you were running away from the police and, you know, that would pick it up. Not that I've ever done that. Uh, but so we, we decided to, to research, and the research was amazing. I mean, the first thing that everybody says to us is, why doesn't everybody know about this? And that was exactly the, the feeling I had when I went into the medical research that there was for thermography. And it was just amazing. It was as if all of these things that Rosa wanted were, were all already there in this package. And we'll, we'll go a little bit later in, you know, into how it works. But the, the lady before, Xander, is it? Um, the sp Xandria, before, was talking about the, the, the cellular level. And it's at, at that level that you need to pick up the, the, the things because tumours can take anything, a minimum of eight to ten years to develop. Uh, sometimes a lot more primary tumours, anybody, anyway, can take that long. Um, so we knew Rosa had a tumour. We didn't even have to touch, we could see the tumour. It was that big. And um, it certainly didn't want to go through the compression of mammography, but we needed to know the status of how it was. So we decided that we would um, go down it, it, the um, thermograph way. And um, what interested me was that the predictions from thermography was that they could discover the early signs of cancer way before a mammogram kit could. And we all know that you know mammograms are the gold standard and that's what we're supposed to do. Um, but when we looked into it and looked into how this worked, and how it picked up the slightest changes of body temperature, which was converted into infrared. I know there's a lady uh, coming on who's going to talk about the light in our body and how important it is. Well, before I just hand back to Rosa again, thermography or infrared is oozing from everybody's body now. It's information that is just pouring out of everybody. If we could see at the level of the infrared camera, all you would see is light pouring out of your body. And it's that information that the thermal imaging cameras pick up. And with the analytic software that we've got now, it's quite easy to determine when, where there is a, um, a fault, a uh, an abnormality. Nobody knows what it is at that stage, but we know that there is something wrong, and it's at that stage that we can pick up, and that maybe it just means something um, as simple as lifestyle changes. Yeah, okay? What I'm going to do, I'm going to pass you back to Phil in a minute, just talk a bit about levels of radiation as well, because this is another concern of mine when, when I was looking at uh, screening and finding out what was going on in, in my tumour and my body. Um, but I just wanted to just tell you very briefly, what we're talking about here, here today um, is, is, not, is not really about diagnostic screening as such. And the film is based on routine screening. And what, from all the research that we've done, what we're looking at is, is we're using a machine on women that harms every one of them um, to healthy women to look for a problem. And, and basically, that isn't right. And that's what we're passionate about changing. So thermography is much safer to use on women whether they're they're healthy or whether they're not it's a much better way but it's a, it's it's really good for routine screening now i don't know whether you know um uh, people know about the levels of radiation is this something that people know already the radiation that they get when they have a mammogram because we didn't know as m much we thought we knew and then when we, we actually started filming the top people in the country about it, we realized actually we didn't know. 
And the most surprising fact is that most, most doctors don't know either. So I just feel it's really good at explaining this. So I just wanted him to go through a, a few... Um, a few things with you, which I think will open your eyes to what is actually happening out there. Can I pass, can I pass it back? No pressure there, then. <laughs> right. When we're talking about the levels of radiation that we use, does anybody know what type of radiation it is first? What type of radiation is used? Right. It's called ionizing radiation. Now, the miscompre of ionizing radiation is that the radiation itself is ionized and that's not right you become ionized so that when the rays from the x-ray hit or interact with matter in this case you you become ionized so that means one thing everybody is damaged there is no safe dose of ionizing radiation. And, and to become ionized, what happens is that the waves tear away electrons out of every atom in every cell, and therefore uh, an, a, a, an atom without an electron is a free radical. So the, elect the, the um, mammogram itself creates anti uh, free radicals. So we're all damaged. Now, it's the tracks of those, when those electrons are just torn away out of orbit. Now, if you can imagine at an energy level how much power it takes to do that, then we're all, you know, dental x-rays. We just go and we sit there. And we let it happen because we, we don't have an idea. And the biggest problem to me is, is that we don't know at that stage that anything happens. So we really have to look about the levels of healing and how do we change the cells. How do we give the cells the information where we can damage P53 and so we haven't got the protein that is going to help us or cause apoptosis in the cells anymore. But even if we did, and the cells were given the information to correct the DNA, and so the RNA doesn't copy the wrong DNA, then the body starts to heal, but at a level, a non-physical level, at an energetic level, we're starting to heal, or we still creating the damage. So if we look at being healed and the body is starting to heal, what do we do next? You go for another mammogram or you go for another x-ray and you do exactly the same things. You tear more electrons away from the atoms that are there and cause more damage. And when the, the electrons are torn away from these atoms, they leave tracks. And it's those tracks that can cause the damage. So that was the first thing that we, when we looked at it, so that's when we say that having a mammogram, from our point of view, can only increase every woman's chance of getting breast cancer. Now that doesn't seem a good idea to use that as routine um, uh, mammograms. We're not saying that mammography doesn't have a place it probably will, will do in diagnostic mammograms if we have a lump and if we decide we want that lump either biopsying or removed well then we're going to need something that can pinpoint where we where we are but the problem is is to take healthy women and subject them to something that is going to damage them because at the stage when most women go for a mammogram, they've had their invite, they're healthy. You answered that. <laughs> you answer it. <laughs> um, and, and so you can see where we're coming from and where we had to make the changes and to sort of, women are not being told the truth. And so this again led on to the idea of why we do, why we started to build up the 
um, the documentary or information that we put into the documentary. And so we decided that we were going to find all of the top people we could in the world. And, well, you know, we were sitting down there with lists of all these people for about a month and saying, well, I don't think he'll do it. She probably won't do it. And we'd never picked the phone up, so we convinced ourselves that, you know, nobody was going to be interested. But we got a shock when we actually picked up the phone because if you don't ask, it's always no. And when we picked up the phone and asked these people, quite a lot of them were willing to be filmed, which was amazing. There were a lot of them that avoided us like the plague and don't want to be. They're, they're okay. They will sit down and talk to you and tell you all kinds of fairy tales. Get them in front of a camera. Ask them the questions. That's when you're going to find out the truth. And a lot of these people, we, we have had oncologists, breast surgeons, who when we say, we're making a film, would you like to be involved in it? They'll say, yeah, great, come along. And they always ask for a list of questions. And so when we send them the questions, all of a sudden, can't do it, playing golf, gone out, wife's pregnant, so yeah, whatever. <laughs> and it, get, it got to the stage where when we were trying to involve government people, the health minister, the deputy health minister, the shadow health minister, all of these people were all of a sudden out of the country. <laughs> and those that weren't, when we, when we actually went down to film some of these people, we were met in car parks by government officials and escorted into um, our interviews and our filming um, and told that we weren't allowed to take still photographs. We couldn't film the outside of the hospital. We couldn't talk to anybody, and the only person that we could talk to was the person that we were filming, and we had to stick to the questions. Of course, we didn't, and th it was too late then. We could film them, and one of the things that we did was we left the cameras running when we said, cut. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, I'm not going to throw it. Sorry. <laughs> or we tried to distract them. We had one of the uh, one of the government officials holding up one of the screens, so we <laughs> the light's not right in here. Can you hold this? And all these people sort of. But anyway, that I'm. Di I'm, I'm, I'm I have, haven't I? All oh, right. So all the way through this, we were asking people and say, "Well, okay, can you please tell me the level?" of radiation that women are subjected to. And what they, they, they'll come out with all kinds of jargon. But what they usually do is they put it down to the equivalent of a chest X-ray. Now, a chest X-ray is around about one one thousandth of a rad, yeah? Now, in the some of the magazines, they will do the trials and say, well, we used 3.7 milligray or m milligray for this. But in England, it says that we use 4.5. Now, if you do the math, that's the equivalent of 1,800 chest X-rays in one routine mammogram. Now, we can't say that. Don't write that down. <laughs> because... That, but, but it actually does work out like that, but we can't say that because when we ask, we've got to go by what we've been told. So when we ask the, the head nuclear medicine professor, what is the level of radiation that women are exposed to when they have routine mammograms? And the guy, as you will see, says 10. But, as you say, we have four images. So that's 40, yeah? So that's 40 chest x-rays in one go. Now, he says that so flippantly that it doesn't mean anything. 40 chest x-rays. I mean, if your doctor said, well, we'll give you a chest x-ray, we're going to do 40 in one day, you'd run. If your doctor said, I'm going to give you a chest x-ray every week for a year, you'd think he was a lunatic. And you would say no. But you do subject yourself to that amount of radiation. 
ionizing radiation when you have a routine mammogram. Now, that's what the top guy said about radiation. Now, in the BMJ, when we look at the equivalents here, it says it's 20. So now we're talking 80. Now, this is in the BMJ, um, and you all know how, how, how truthful this is. Um, but, when, but when things are printed like this, we, we, we can say that, okay, it's 80 chest x-rays. So that's about one x-ray for a year and a half, every week for a year and a half. Now, that doesn't seem too right. And it's definitely not something. If, you, if, if all of the women in here who'd been for a mammogram and had a mammogram would have known that, would you have gone? All right. If you'd have known that it was over, well, uh, 300 newtons is around about just over 64 pounds worth of pressure on your breast, and they can use anything from 10 to um, 300 newton, newtons to to compress your breast. Now, if you knew that, and you knew that if you were a healthy woman and you had a tumor or a lump at a stage where it wasn't palpable, you couldn't feel it, but it was there, and I'm going to make this look like a tit pancake, would you go? Well, that's what you've got to say. I mean, I'm sorry about saying pancake. <laughs> Get away. <laughs> Right. Now, but don't be alarmed if you didn't know the levels of radiation that you, you know, that you, you don't know them. Well, guess what? Again, BMJ, Doctor's Knowledge of Radiation Exposure Questionnaire Study. I'm only going to read a part of this. We interviewed 40 senior house officers, 40 specialist registrars, 40 consultants, and 10 consultant radiologists. None of them knew the approximate dose of radiation received by a patient during a chest x-ray. When they done the survey, the, the, the minimum score anybody got was zero. The maximum score was 59%. Now, these are the guys and the people that you're going to. They just, oh, go for a CT scan. You're okay. Well, a CT scan is 400 times one chest X-ray. And the barium swallow, does that mean I've got 25 or does that mean I've got five? Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll hand it back to you in a minute. The the barium swallow is another 400 chest x-rays equivalent. So what are we subjecting ourselves to? Just to finish off this, it says the estimated doses of radiation were much lower than the correct doses. For example, a patient undergoing a, an arteriogram of the leg would receive 400 times the radiation of a chest x-ray um, but the answer was 20, the answer that doctors gave was 26 times lower than that. So when you're told to go for your x-ray or your CT scan or your mammogram, the people who are telling you to go don't know the levels of radiation that you're exposed to. And the last thing that might surprise you, when we were filming, we were invited into um, a, a, a mammogram unit, and we there were two radiologists and a radiographer. Oh no, two radiographers and a radiologist, and we asked the same question: What are the levels? And none of them knew. Uh, the guy that, and this was the top guy in the hospital, said, "Well, I'll have to go and have a look at that for you." Okay, okay Rosa. There you go. Um. The main thing about uh, mammography as well, because I want to quickly get on to thermography, because that's what I'm going to talk to you about, really, um, um, is the overdiagnosis of women as well. Um, they're, they're, um, they're saying it's around about 30% of women since 1987, since a mammogram was introduced by our lovely Margaret Thatcher. Um, that's a bit topical, that, isn't it, actually? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that uh, women have been overdiagnosed. And this has been quite a frightening thing, really, because what you're looking at is that what they're saying is, is possibly 30% of women that have been treated for breast cancer since 1987, since they used to introduce a mammography, would probably never have died of their tumour. And But we'll, you'll see more about ductal carcinoma in situ um, in the film, anyway. This is a condition that many women are being treated for, treated as if they have cancer, and they don't. There's nothing, nothing active. And with thermography, we do, we've, uh, even just in the last six weeks, we've saved three women from having mastectomies who were told that they had active tumours and ductal carcinoma in situ and were told to um, um, go in and have their breasts taken off. So all we're doing with these women now is monit monitoring them. And of course, most of the women that, that come and see us, they're, they're into alternatives. So they're changing things around and they're changing their lifestyles and they're, they're doing everything as, um, as um, safely and naturally as possible. So I just wanted to move on a bit. Um, oh, I thought this is great. I don't know, do you see uh, anybody um, get onto Natural News? It's on naturalnews.com. It says, um, detect cancer or cause cancer. They're the buttons. And it says, which button do I push? Usually we just punch them both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we've gone through that anyway. Let's just get on. So thermography. What's the difference between thermography and mammography? Mammography is, is an anatomical look at the breast. So we see structure with a mammogram. Um, and thermography is a physiological look at the body. So we see the early stages of disease. These are the things that happen um, before you actually get, the, say, the structure of a tumour. Um, it can be used, thermography can be used all, you know, we do full body scans for people. Um, we, d we do a lot of men, we do a lot of people with injuries. It's not just breast cancer, but that is our passion really because of what we've been through ourselves personally. Um, and when I found thermography, I thought it was the best thing since sliced bread because it meant I didn't have to have my breast compressed, radiated, and uh, also, uh, I didn't really want a biopsy either because biopsying, as you know, um, can trigger, probably no, can trigger angiogenesis and that's what's, you need that for the spread of cancer around the body. So I didn't want to do that. Um, so um, I never had the biopsy. So when I went down to um, have my first thermogram, I came back with high risk for malignance, for malignancy, which is the top of the, the thing. So, um, but basically what I did with thermography then, because we pick up cell changes every 90 days, I used it to monitor myself getting better. And that's the beauty of anybody with cancer. Um, with thermography, there's no radiation, it's not gonna harm you, and it picks up early changes. You might not see the physical changes happening in your body, but there will be physiological changes happening first. So physiological changes mean that we don't see structure, so we don't see lumps. What we see is the activity around the area. So I just want to move on a bit. Um, it's suitable for everybody. This is the whole point of thermography. The way that I look at this and the way Phil looks at it is that you know they're doing all these things with women, um, y young girls, you know, with these vaccines, but you know, um, cervical cancer is so much lower than than um, breast cancer in terms of women's lives. So the way, the way we look at it is that if you were to use thermography and in like a, n a routine screening from 20 onwards for all young girls, and men if they want to, because men get breast cancer as well, um, and take two lots of pho photos of them, 90 days in between, you would get a baseline for all them. And that means that they're, they're, you've got the thumbprint of their breasts um, on film. And anything that deviates from that, we know things are starting to change. So we can be seeing things happening in the breast many years before a mammogram can even see it. And I'm, I'm going to show you some things. And if we did that, you, women should, many women would never get to the point. What's the point of finding it when you're... When, you know, it's like eight years down the line and you've got something that a mammogram can pick it up. When you can pick it up so much earlier. Um, yeah, so this, I mean, this here, if you can see here, li this, you can see, one, with your thermal pattern, everything is symmetrical when you're in good health. 
Um, when things start to develop, we start to see these in heat patterns. Um, thermographically, things, you know, um, illnesses, diseases, where there's nerve damage, circulation problems, that sort of thing, we will see as cooler colours. Where there's inflammation in the body, we see this as warmer colours. So you can see here, this lady's breasts, there isn't a tumour there yet, but we know there's something going on there. Yeah, we see this. This is probably about three years into it, and we will see these sorts of patterns starting to develop. Yeah? So that's far better, isn't it, than waiting until you've, you've got a lump. These are like normal breasts, just to show you. Yeah, so they're quite cool. You find that women that have smaller breasts and nearer the chest and nearer the vital organs, um, basically they, they, they tend to be warmer. This is 17 years annual screening. So you'll see normal, and she had a normal mammogram. I wouldn't have sent that her for a mammogram, but you can see it stayed the same. The pattern stayed the same all the way through. Can you see it? Can everybody see that, yeah? And you just get a picture of a woman's breasts. Now, this is really interesting because cells, cancer cells, like double every 90 days. So what we're, so what we're seeing here is this here that you can see here, this area here, is what we class as ductal carcinoma in situ, okay? This is very early. There's no tumor there yet, okay? So we're about, we're about here, but here it's still undetectable. If you went for a mammogram, you wouldn't see anything, yeah? Um, and it takes, this is in the film actually, but it takes about eight years before, and it's doubled about 32 times before you'll um, be able to see it on a mammogram. Am I running out of time? <laughs> All right. Baseline. Yeah, okay. Baseline. So this is the lady's baseline here. You'll see here, there's a bit of activity in the top of the right breast, but you'll see how that develops over 12 months. So what we tend to do with women, if they want to, they can come every year and have a mammogram, especially if they have a history of breast cancer. Or, so, sorry, oh, sorry, am I? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so then come every year if they want to, especially if they've got a history of it, um, or they've they've got BRCA1, BRCA2, where they have the G mutation, it means their breasts aren't being radiated and they can monitor things. If they've had a mastectomy, um, um, ductal carcinoma situ, where we monitor women, you know, and just uh, see what's happening and see if anything's starting to build up. Um, let's have a look what's next. Again, that's just early early um, ductal carcinoma in situ. And here, I'm just showing you some pictures so you know what they look like, really. You'll see the areas of heat. And this is, we do things on grayscale. And again, ductal carcinoma in situ. I've just given you uh, an idea of what the sort of things that we see. Um, inflammatory breast cancer. Thermography is the only screening in the world that can pick up the early stages of inflammatory breast cancer. Um, here, this is for breast cancer, yeah? As you can see, the breast being uh, eaten away. Pregnancy, they both look very much the same, don't they? Benign cyst, so if a woman's got a lump or whatever, if there's no activity, oh, my pictures have gone. There's meant to be pictures on that before and after, sorry. Here we are. These are women come in with high-risk readings that turn it around in three months to uh, stable or, or low risk, yeah? You can see the difference here. These are the ones before and these are the ones after. Just by making lifestyle changes, changing things around. Again, same sorts of things. Do you understand? Can you see them? You, can you see what I'm s talking about? Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 um, the white bits are the hottest bits. You always get this under the breast. Yeah, you get natural heat, especially if a baby, uh, lady's got large breasts. You know, if it, if they haven't, they're very small. You won't get that heat really underneath. But yeah, that's quite normal. That's the hottest point. The white bit's the hottest point. Going, go yeah, going going into yeah. She was high risk. Yeah, okay. But she came. We got her on a. She lost about two stone as well, didn't she? Yeah. Anyway, um, that just we've got to get on to the film. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go. On. 
Sorry, we'll do the film because that's a bit of that's I think everybody's waiting for. But ductal carcinoma in situ, you know, when when people are talking about overdiagnosis, you know, that the, the risks of uh, having a mammogram are, you know, uh, they reckon that um, incidents of ductal carcinoma in situ have gone up by around about 400%. Well, a mammogram can't overdiagnose. So where does the, the overdiagnosis come from? The first thing is, is that ductal carcinoma in situ isn't cancer. Uh, you, we should even remove carcinoma from the terminology because it's a calcification. And at the stage, and doctors, some doctors will tell you that when you are diagnosed with DCIS, you should be told it is no threat to your life. Well, considering we get um, a threat to, um, a, no threat to your life, what are the treatments that are offered for ductal carcinoma in situ. Mastectomy, followed by chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So this is where we turn healthy women into cancer patients and give them treatments that can kill them from a situation where DCIS is not invasive. It's, it's, it, it shouldn't be, it should be monitored rather than as they, the same as they do with prostrate cancer yeah invasive ductal carcinoma is still ductal yeah, it, yeah it, but it's it, it they have levels but when we're talking about the the, the levels of um it, it's still a, a, a dcis so when we're when we're um when when we're told, or women are told, again, we, we, in the film we've gone through either 30%, 50%, 85% of chance of this, and I want you to listen to this because this is really important. When you're told that you have whatever percentage it is of that ductal carcinoma becoming cancer in years to come, there is absolutely no medical evidence to support that. The trials are not finished. So when somebody says you've got a percentage, they're lying. We're going to be here anyway this afternoon. Yeah, we're finished. Um, we're going to. So if anybody wants to come and talk to us, um, we travel around. We're based in Liverpool anyway, our screening service. But we we travel around to to thirteen of the clinics. So. Um, if anybody you know wants a thermogram or wants to come and see us, we're, we're probably somewhere near you anyway. Okay, and thank you very much for today and, and your time. Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs>